soil food web. Um, whoop, gotta move that there for a second. Um, a quick review of the soil food web. The soil food web is um, a term. I'm not sure if Elaine Ingham, Dr. Elaine Ingham, coined it, but she certainly is running with it. Um, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a it's a process under the soil in the soil that's working um, with all different components of microorganisms. We're talking about amoebas and diatoms and um, nematodes and protozoas, uh, earthworms, macro big big organisms, spiders, this that, and then but uh, really important ones are the microorganisms, the the bacteria and fungi. Okay, they are going to make the engine run. So we want to do everything in our possible possible to foster the soil food web. So even though we're having to talk about bugs and diseases, we've got to talk about the soil food web. So do everything in our power to really enhance the soil food web is our goal for first and foremost for disease and pests. Um, a little side note, critical for organic gardeners and farmers is prevention. Okay, when you have a big bug problem or a disease problem, it's very difficult to come back two months later and start to try to annihilate it with some, you know, organic pesticide or fungicide. Really what needs to happen is prevention. So that's going to be a lot of what my talk's about. This is the foundation. Compost, compost, and more compost. I'm, it's getting redundant, but this is the, this is it. This is one way that you can help feed that soil food web um, and really get it to, to get that engine running the best, particularly on Cape Cod, our sandy soils just, just totally uh, oxidizes organic matter quickly. We need to just keep adding organic matter to our soil. Just keep doing it. Composted manure, composted vegetables, whatever you can get, um, whatever you can afford, whatever you can make um, needs to get on the soil. Um, on Cape Cod, it would be very difficult to add too much. Um, if you're in a very he heavy clay soils, adding extra compost helps to open up the soil and make the drainage better and all and the soil microbes and the soil food web work better. Okay. So compost, compost, and more compost. Cover crops. We talked about that last week. Um, co cover crops are important. They can take up excess of nutrients that are in your soil, pull them up into the leaf of the plant when you're ready to till that under with the broad fork or the garden fork gently. Um, it can break down and supply uh, nutrients for the following crop. Um, what cover crops really do the best is they create these exudates in the root systems. So the more diversified cover crops we have, the more that biological engine is going to run. Mulch. Mulch is uh, another source of organic matter, um, as long as we're not talking about plastic mulch. Um, so plastic mulch is widely used in organic farms, widely used um, in many different forms, thick weed mat, to all the way down to thin uh, plastic that's only used for a season and then disposed of. Um, I'm a fan of salt marsh hay because I live on Cape Cod and I can get it. Um, this year uh, is looking like a banner mulch gathering year. So um, go out and find yourself some mulch, salt marsh hay, and seaweed. Um, if not, um, you're going to need some. Every garden should have it, including uh, container gardens, by the way. We the salt marché we do not rinse any longer. That's a very good question. We used to rinse. Um, historically, it was always taken after the high king tides and the moon tides in March, and then after the big rains, and they would take it from the high high water marks. Um, I did that for years. We would take it, then I would bring it to the farm. I'd lay it all out on the on the on the roadways and whatever, and rinse it all off with sprinklers, and then it just was like, I'm like, this is just taking me to, this is just too much time. I can't afford to do this and still make a living farming. So I just went right from the marsh, right to the field, and we never saw a difference. So we rinsed it for about eight years of my life, the first eight years of me growing, and then I never rinsed it again. Um, now, as a Korean natural farmer, one of our inputs is fermented seawater. So the more we've delved into nutrient availability, except, you know, nutrients on the planet, 
seawater is actually one of the best things you can put in your garden to remineralize unbalanced soils. Okay. It's not just food for the, you know, it's, it's mainly food for the soil food web. Okay. So, um, very good question. It so was a hot topic in the Cape Cod Gardening Facebook page a couple of weeks ago, but um, really a, a very important um, tool for us locally and for anyone near the coast, obviously, um, to utilize the ocean's bounty. Okay, um, it is sustainably done here. It grows, it regrows, it grows, it regrows. Um, it's been harvested on Cape Cod for ever. Um, so as long as it, you know. We tread lightly where we go and get it. Uh, I think it's relatively one of the more sustainable ingredients we can use. And it doesn't have weed seeds, like terrestrial weed seeds. So um, it's not going to add lots more weeds to your garden. Yes. Um, Claudia is asking what depth of mulch do you recommend? That would be is specific for the crop I'm growing. But generally speaking, I would want to get six to eight inches on there. It depends on the mulch, too. So like if you have a, um, you know, if you're using like bark and, 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 you know, wood chips and things like that, it can be a little bit thinner, but with salt marsh hay and if you use straw, a lot of people use straw, um, you know, more is better in, in this situation. Um, it's also more organic matter that's going to get in your soil eventually. So it's not a bad thing. Um, certain things that are like wood chips have the potential of, robbing nitrogen to break down the carbon in the wood chips. So straight wood chips can um, pull nitrogen out of a plant and make it look yellow and look like nitrogen deficient because it's that nitrogen is being is a mobile ion and can move out of the plants root membranes the other direction and help break down uh, carbon and that's in the soil. So um, typically wood chips we use a lot um, on perennial things. We use a lot of wood chips um, in areas that we're developing. So we're getting that soil food web going, utilizing wood chips in that process. Um, we use wood chips in what's called our IMO4, Indigenous Microorganisms 4. That's next week's conversation on Korean natural farming. But um, wood chips can, are incredibly beneficial for your soil. Um, they do a really great job um, building soil over a long stretch of time. Um, but be careful, of, you know, putting it right there and then sticking some arugula plants right into the wood chips. You know, if you buy composted wood chips, like, you know, a lot of from the different companies around or bags, that's usually gone through some processing of being composted a little bit. So it's not, it's going to steal as much nitrogen. Um, so generally speaking, hay and salt marsh hay, six to eight inches uh, more sometimes is better. If it's, you know, you can add some back later if you're using it for weed, uh, weed prevention, which is important. Um, so keeping it, the weeds down by adding more as time goes on, um, the problem with mulch, it keeps the soil cool. So we put the mulch on either let the ground warm up a little bit and then get the mulch on there after things grow, or if we're transplanting, we just get it on a little early and open up the holes where the transplants are going to go. So that little root zone there where the transplant is going to go, maybe a few weeks, we have it opened up. So it starts to kind of get a little bit of the sun's energy, um, but the goal is to keep a nice, even moisture, keep uh, weeds down. Um, the other downside to mul living mulch, uh, to an uh, organic mulch, potentially is slugs and snails. It's a nice spot for them to be. So also in the spring, you can kind of watch that and go a little bit light and then come back later when that pressure's off a little bit. Korean natural farming. Um, this is uh, a method created by Master Cho Next week, we're going to talk a whole lot about it when I have my discussion on what's called Beyond Organic. Um, this is a style of farming that I've been turned on to, and I'm now a certified soil smith trained uh, to teach advanced levels of KNF. So, um, and stay tuned in the future because we're going to be hosting a lot of events at our farm in Churro, which where we're going to be doing this hands on. Um, but basically, KNF is a, is a way of building the soil, bringing it back into balance, using indigenous microorganisms from the forest. We collect them, grow them, multiply them, and add them to our soils on our farms and gardens. Phenomenal uh, uh, form of, of growing things and a great way to add other things. I also do biodynamic farming. So we're going to do a little, I'll talk about that next week too, but not just going the traditional organic route, but breaking it up and using different inputs and different techniques from around the world 
Um, and Master Cho has created a very simple, easy thing to do, as well as his son who created something called Jadam. So we'll talk about that next week, but this is a really great way to get your disease and pest control. And KNF has a lot more than just what's in the soil. There's other things that we can do, uh, liquid IMO, things like that to, for disease and pests as well. All right. How do soil organisms, uh, natural defenses actually work? Um, soil organisms and disease micro and disease control is important because what we're trying to do is have a biologically rich, very diversified soil. So we want lots of the good organisms, the non-pathogenic ones that are there able to outcompete. And then if there's a problem, potentially take care of it with uh, you know, with the, the organism itself having, well, basically like it's like biological warfare going on under your soil. So nematodes do a great job at eating, you know, uh, maintaining uh, beneficial nematodes in the soil, little microscopic, little cool looking things. They go around eating the root not nematodes, the pathogenic nematodes. They um, will eat things like, uh, uh, fungus gnat, larvae, other soil-borne organisms that can damage your crops um, can help keep it in balance. As far as disease control too, it really helps keep soil-borne organisms like septoria down to a minimum. The more beneficial organisms we have in our soil, the better it can fight off things like septoria, leaf blight, other soil-borne organisms that affect all of our tomatoes, a lot of our crops and flowers as well. So I'm really trying to get a diversified um, profile of organisms in what's called the rhizosphere, right around the roots of a plant. Um, another amazing thing, and I don't, it's not down there yet, um, that soil microorganisms do is uh, bacteria called endophytes are in the soil. When the root germinates, there's a discussion. The endophytes actually get into the root and go up into the plant systemically and help defend the plant from the inside out. So endophytes is a really very important aspect of soil microorganisms and disease control, really giving it inner strength um, uh, as well. Another great thing for disease control is when the soil microorganisms are really cranking and there's enough silica in the soil, the organisms can break down that silica and make it more readily available for the plant. Silica is very important for cell wall production, okay? The more silica available to your plant in plant form after the bacteria and, fung and microorganisms do their job, um, the stronger the cell walls can get. Well, a, a pathogenic fungus tries to go through the leaf, like a powdery mildew, let's say, for example, tries to get into the leaf through its cell walls. If the cell walls are thicker, the, the hypha of the, micro of the fungus cannot get in there and penetrate. So once again, from the inside out, this is a mineral base. It's not a, it's not an endophyte, but it's those organisms will help available, make more silica available um, with sandy soils and other things around us. Um, silica is in pretty good supply, um, but it's not in plant form. So it needs to go through this organisms to become plant form. Um, things like horsetail we use in biodynamic is high in silica. Alfalfa is high in silica. So there are some things we can actually add to our soil to bring up the levels of silica, okay? Making sure that your oats are from a very good source because oats are bioaccumulators and they can take up toxic uh, from the soil. And if it's grown in the wrong place, you could transfer some of that over. So we really want to make sure that, the, um, that you source your oats uh, appropriately, okay? All right, beneficial insects and pest control. Um, using nature here we're not talking about any human stuff at this point we're talking about beneficial insects those are what we call the good bugs everyone wants to call them good bugs um the good bugs for all intents and purposes eat the bad bugs okay um so what do we want to do to increase our beneficial insects which can then affect our pest control we want to have a healthy soil with a lot of diversified plants around not growing one type of plant. We want to grow potentially a uh, beneficial insectary. We want to grow plants. They're going to actually feed and rear the young. We're going to give them uh, pollen, I mean, uh, nectar and things like that. So we want to encourage an area in our garden or farm or homes, 
grow the right types of uh, flowers, beneficial uh, pollinating type plant uh, pollinators, they'll call them pollinator plants, um, to get those beneficial insects a good home. The green lacewing is a great example of this. And we want to get as many green lacewings onto our farm as possible. They do a plethora of disease control or pest control. Um, so that's the goal is to give a habitat specifically for the beneficial insects. Okay. Everyone hears about ladybugs. Yep. Lady, lady, lady beetles. It's, it's actually not a bug. It's a beetle. Um, lady beetles are phenomenal. A lot of people like them for their aphid control and things like that. Um, the actual, the best part of the lady beetle is actually its larva and it's called the aphid alligator. Okay. It's this little black looking alligator thing with some orange stripes in it. And um, you'll, once you see it, you realize, oh, I saw that when I was a kid and I've seen that before. And like, it's a, it's an insect that you've seen, but um, the aphid alligator eats a whole lot more than the lady beetle does. And the lady beetle was very common in the industry to buy lady beetles at your nursery and then add them to your garden. It's all good and fine, except that they fly. So you know, a lot of that is going to fly away. When they mate, if they haven't mated, then they got to go up, I think it's like 500 feet or something. And that's some crazy thing. And they mate, and then the wind blows them around. So um, in greenhouses, it's beneficial. But the real beneficial insect to, to get into your garden would be the aphid alligator, the larvae, which are also available from certain sectories. Um, um, dragonflies. dragonflies are good. Mm -hmm. Dragonflies are good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. That's a really good component. Um, so important. Let's grow things. Let's have good soil, grow some plants. They're going to increase our beneficial insects and give them a home to basically rear their young. Okay. So it's an insectary, we call it beneficial insectary, grow a little strip, uh, white alyssum, really beautiful, smells nice, bring, brings in the good bugs. Okay. Yeah. All right. Back to the silica, there was a question, mm -hmm. why would we want to add silica to our soil when we're surrounded by sand? On Cape Cod, that is, we, we like I said, on Cape Cod, we don't really, not too deficient in silica, but so we don't need to, but you still need to get the biological activity going so that the silica becomes plant available. If it's not, if, if the engine's not running perfectly, then that silica is going to sit there and you're going to walk around it all day. Um, extra silica doesn't hurt either so um particularly if it's directly um, sprayed onto the leaf surface which is what we do in um a, a biodynamic preparation is horsetail the plant horsetail high in silica um, we spray that onto our plants getting that cell benefit uh increased cell wall size directly on the plant so you can bypass that. And that's something we do. We we work with the soil and we also spray the leaf as well. The goal here is that your soil is getting everything going and you have that, that second or third slide where it said healthy soil equals healthy plants. If everything's running on, on, on all cylinders and everything's up going well, the goal here that you're not going to have to do anything. You're going to, your soil is going to be taking care of the situation. Um, so uh, by doing these techniques that will help. Um, but Good question. Cape Cod, we do have a lot of silica, um, but you'll know all that because you're going to get your soil tests because we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. So soil tests are great because it gives you a picture of what's going on under your feet. All right. How do we foster soil microorganisms and uh, microbes and beneficial insects? Well, compost, 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 number one, cover crops, mulch, number two, we grow insectaries. Um, for the beneficial insects. So that's the main way we do that. Um, it's It seems very simple and I suppose it is. Um, nature is a pretty fine-tuned organism, if, if we wanna call it that. I definitely wanna call the earth an organism. Um, so all we can do to create healthy soils is really the best way to foster soil microbes. And in turn, grow the beneficial insectaries. Diversity is key in life, okay? We really need a lot of everything, okay? We need a lot of different funguses. We need a lot of different people. We need a lot of different animals, right? We need we need reptiles. We need all sorts of stuff. Um, so diversity, is, we're going to keep coming back to that. Um, it's really important to encourage all diversity in your garden 
if you're a home gardener and you just want to grow tomatoes, that's fine. But try to plant a few things here and there, a little different, break it up the break up the cycles. Okay. All right. Pest and disease, the strategies, prevention. Um, all right. I'm going to, it's kind of redundant, but we're going to just, there's the first one. Okay. There's the second one. Okay. We've been talking about these. Crop rotation. Talked about this last week. I um, mean, I just led into it by growing tomatoes in the same place year after year. If you grow tomatoes in the same location year after year, all the nutrients that the, that's in the soil that tomatoes like are being mined year after year. So you're unless you're replacing them and getting them all back, you're actually just taking everything the plant needs to grow, that specific type of plant, the tomato in this, uh, just in this uh, example, um, and you're mining the nutrients without getting it uh, rebuilt back up. The same exudates, less diversity starts to happen. Um, the important, uh, as far as diseases go and pests, we're breaking up cycles of things. Uh, everyone experiences late blight, early blight, septoria, all these uh, diseases, mainly soil-borne organisms that then can also get uh, wind-driven too and water-driven, but they are, um, if you grow the same crop year after year, the potential, and I can tell you from experience, you will have some great tomato years, but then by year three or four, of if you keep going in the same location or in the same greenhouse, this is the problem with greenhouse growers is they start and they get a bunch of good years in their tomato greenhouse, and then it starts to go downhill um, and harder to maintain. So um, rotating crops is very important, even if it's on the smallest of gardens. Um, we did talk about someone with like a 10 by 12 type garden or four by four. Um, breaking it up as best as you can. Um, uh, just brought back to me, but there was a great book. I want to say his name is Mel Bartholomew, the square foot gardener. It's called square foot gardening. Um, he was, he broke out his gardens in square foot increments and where to plant things and how to rotate things around. So um, it was a book I didn't talk about last week, um, but square foot gardening for the home gardener. It's a good book as far as you can kind of get a layout of how things are designed. And um, he's got some really good information in crop rotation in that book. So um, I want to give that, and I believe, no, that's not Mel Bartholomew. I mean, that's the other guy. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but um, it's, uh, it is, um, yeah, maybe you could put it in the chat. Um, the square foot gardener. Um, okay. So with crop rotation and healthy soil and, and increasing our beneficial insect count, either through buying them in or encouraging them to come um, in crop rotation. The next important thing is seed selection. If you really do have a problem, let's say with powdery mildew on your cucumbers and you can't seem to get rid of it um, or your pumpkins or your zucchini or something, maybe trying a, a disease resistant seed that resists that those types of funguses, okay? Um, not typically in the heirloom section of seeds, it's more in the hybrid section of seeds, um, but they were there for a reason and they very often work. Doesn't mean that heirloom plants and seeds don't have um, some good disease resistance and pest resistance. It just means that um, it's less uh, reported. You know, you're not gonna look at a seed thing and be like, oh, fusarium wilt tolerant, you know? So, um, it's too uh, it's too iffy for them to put it on a seed thing. So um, I encourage open pollinated heirloom seed selection by all means, saving seeds, sharing them with your seed library, sharing with your neighbors, um, regionalizing seeds that way, very important for disease and pests because the pests and diseases, I, even though climate's warming and our everything's changing, it still is a relatively slow change. So when we have pests, pressures, it comes from the same, relatively same time of year, okay? So the striped cucumber beetle starts to march up from the south. And by the time it gets here, you know, we kind of generally have an idea. And I'm going to let you know in a little bit about um, uh, a really good publication, at least in Massachusetts, um, uh, about following insects and diseases uh, information. So we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so seed selection is a real critical part of the strategy. And if you've noticed, I haven't talked once about pesticides or fungicides yet, right? Because that's not our goal. 
Okay. Is it a tool in our tool belt? Definitely. But is it the one we really need to be focusing on? No. Okay. So those of you with individual pests and disease questions, make sure to add them to the chat because um, I can answer how we take care of those issues um, organically. Mechanical. Um, this is something that is going to be new to a lot of you. Um, when I mean mechanical, I mean like creating um, a way of blocking the insect or disease from getting to your plant in the first place. And the typical strategy we use is either a greenhouse, right? Which can physically stop an insect from coming in, okay? Through screens and plastic. The other thing is a product called floating row covers. Reme was one of the first ones that came out. So it's kind of the trade name. It's kind of like the Kleenex of tissues, you know? But um, floating row covers. Um, floating row covers are used for frost protection, which is a good strategy for breaking up insect cycles because you can plant earlier and then cover them with this frost protected little blanket. Floating row covers let air, light, and water through the fabric. It's a polyester spun fabric um, of varying thicknesses. The thicker it is, the more weight it puts down on the plant that it's floating on, floating row covers, but also gives it more frost protection. So if you can interrupt a, a bug cycle by planting two weeks earlier, right, then you can uh, utilize the strategy of reme or a floating row cover to get earlier starts, breaking up some of that, um, the life cycle of an insect. Um, but generally speaking, um, for pests, we use floating row covers in the lightest form, okay? So it lo floats lightly on the plant. Now, if you have a plant like a tomato or a pepper, um, things that have what's called the apical meristem where they grow from the growing tip, you have to put a wire hoop, a little greenhouse, something over them so that that floating row cover, so that doesn't touch that growing tip because it will create, um, the plant won't grow well and it will inhibit the growth of the plant. So things like spinach and lettuce and arugula and beets and broccoli and zucchinis and squashes until they start to flower can just sit underneath this floating row cover and stay protected from insects, okay? So when the squash, um, the squash vine borer moth is flying overhead looking for that squash leaf, that very signature leaf, and all it sees is a big blanket of white because it's underneath this floating row cover, right? Which is white. Um, it's it doesn't see it doesn't go down and lay its eggs because it mechanically can't reach the egg, it reach the plant, and it flies to your neighbor's house and lays the eggs over there. Okay. So the goal is to teach your neighbor to have floating row cover so that they don't have a problem. But your goal is to mechanically, physically stop the insect from getting to lay its eggs. Okay. Striped cucumber beetles, Colorado potato beetles. I mean, there, there's a huge list of insects that can be create, stopped, okay, by floating row covers. Um, so it can be reused. The thinner, obviously, it can tear. You have more issues. Um, maybe finding a medium grade somewhere can minimize that. But um, certain things, but once a zucchini and a squash starts to flower, then we have to pull that floating row cover up because we need the honeybees and other ground bees and bumblebees and things to pollinate those plants. So it's all about timing when it comes to floating row covers, okay? Um, and mechanical strategies, all right? Pesticide sprays, dusts, and oils. Now we're talking about it, okay? For all intents and purposes, I'm gonna talk about organic stuff. If there's specifics about pesticides, um, I know a lot about pesticides, chemicals as well. I can try to answer your questions, but I can tell you that it's not very good because we're trying to foster life and a pesticide is trying to kill life, okay? Fungicides do a very good job killing funguses. And we, because at the top of that list says healthy soil, we're trying to foster good funguses and things. So um, we really need to use this as a last ditch effort. Okay, this is your last thing. If everything else is not working, then we're going to switch in and look at, in our in my case for this talk, organic um, sprays, dusts, which is like a powder or dust that we can use. We don't use it too much anymore, but uh, it does still get used. And different oils um, can be used as well. So um, 
I think I have it, but um, just a, a question about floating bill covers. Sure. Sorry to go backwards. No problem. Um, Claudia asks, how do you use a ring under a floating rope cover? A ring like a tomato cage? Like a hoop, you mean? Or a tomato cage? Don't know. Floating row covers when tomatoes and growing tip points are typically grown with a small gauged metal wire that makes a small little hoop, a half circle, a quonset, if you will, little half circus over your plants as they're growing. So it's kind of pre, um, it's pre tomato cage. Okay. It's pre when you're staking it typically. Okay. Um, you know, Floating row covers for tomatoes, they're big. They get really big. So you have to get creative. If you really have a pest problem that you need to get rid of, as far as when it comes to tomatoes in particular, um, you have to really come up with a good strategy to utilize barriers for tomatoes from the middle of its life to the end of its life, um, because it's a bigger plant. Particularly some of the heirloom interde interdependent tomatoes can get very tall. Um, so... Hoops, mini hoops. Um, I know they sell them at Johnny's Selected Seeds in the back of the catalog. You'll see them pre-cut. You can buy the gauge wire and big rolls and cut them yourselves. That's somewhat more affordable. Also, you can make bigger and smaller hoops. Um, other plants prefer the hoops too, like bok choys and some things. It can grow under there, but if you give it a little extra protection from rubbing up against it, it does, it does help that. Um, and then you can also use that same hoop for plastic in the beginning, if you want to get heat to build up, you can use those hoops later in the fall with plastic again. Um, it's called slitted row covers. Um, they can help uh, extend your season that way. Okay. Another great way to break up the pests is to, like I said earlier, get an early start, break it up that way, or get an extended period and break it up at the end. Okay. So when we're talking about pesticide sprays, we're typically talking about... Um, uh, biologicals such as Bacillus thuringiensis, a bacteria, um, uh, things like um, other botanical sprays, uh, even a lot of the, um, excuse me, some of the uh, Korean natural farming stuff we do, and also um, some of the uh, biodynamic sprays we do. Um, there are fungus type. Uh, that can act for pests and also bio, you know, beneficial funguses that will affect diseases. So when we talk about pesticides for fungus, very often we're using a fungus. Um, spinosad is a very popular one, um, a very, very effective um, uh, pesticide and fungicide. Um, BT is very common. Um, dust and oils, like I said, dusts are not used as much as used to. Um, but certain dusts like dusting with copper and sulfur um, can reduce pest pressure, I mean, disease pressure, pest pressure, disease press. Um, so, uh, but nowadays a lot of those copper and fungicides can also be mixed with water, okay? Oils are a different type of pesticide altogether. They're used more to smother and uh, cover the spiracles on an insect that it won't allow it to breathe any longer. Um, Horticultural grade oils, which we can use almost seasonally. I mean, all through the season. There's dormant oils, which we use on our pests, particularly in fruit trees and other things like that, prior to bud break, which smother overwintering insects. Um, a very important, very important technique in organic fruit production is the use of uh, dormant oils. Um, oil extracts, like the extract from the neem plant would be another botanical one. Um, there's all sorts of different types of biological, um, naturally based um, pesticides and fungicides to use. Um, you want to look for the word OMRI. It's an ad, uh, acronym. O stands for Organic Material Review Institute. So it will say OMRI on the label of the pesticide. Okay. Um, when you see the OMRI logo, you're pretty much good to go. Generally speaking, I don't want you to use pesticides, but if you have to. Um, you want to go for the OMRI certified ones. Okay, but before you start spraying, we got to figure out what pests we have because everything has a specific 
spray that we're going to use or disease in this case. I'll use pet the word pests for both insects, um, animals, and diseases for the most part. Um, so forgive me if I don't flip back and forth between bugs and diseases, but the key here is identification. Okay. We're not going to spray Bacillus thuringiensis BT on something that's not a worm, not in the Lepidopter family. It's just not going to kill certain things, right? It's um, we're going to use different uh, modes of action. So um, if we, we're going to mix things, if we have to, like I said earlier, we do a copper sulfur, copper one, one spray, then we'll go to a sulfur next spray, breaking up the mode of action to help reduce your disease pressure. Um, but once again, prevention is the key. And when it comes to disease prevention in plants organically, prevention is massive, right? Airflow, good watering habits, dry leaf. There's all the cultural things that need to happen for disease prevention. If you're going to reach for sulfur and copper to start spraying because you have a disease, chances are you're too late anyways, okay? When I would use, I don't use it anymore because things are getting more balanced in my world. But when I was um, utilizing copper and sulfur for my tomato production, um, it's a very good fungicide um, for late blight, septoria, a lot of the problems we have. Um, when you're walking down your garden and you look at your tomato plants and you go, God, they just look so good right now. They're like a few feet tall. They're green. They're sturdy. They're looking amazing. That's when I spray for my copper and sulfur stuff. And then I usually do a two to three week regimen where I'll mix back and forth for the next. And that's the preventative case because there's things going on biologically on those leaf surface that you're not seeing right now. And that's three, four weeks later, you're like, what happened to my beautiful tomato plants? Now I have this yellow leaves from the bottom and it turn into brown and everything's dying from the bottom up. Um, so prevention is really, really important for everything, but it's most important to know what you have. If you don't know what you have, then you don't know what to, what tool to grab in your toolbox, okay? So IDing pests and diseases is of the utmost importance, okay? I um, mean, to do that, you want to follow the basic structure of um, integrative pest management plan, okay? IPM is what people call it. it it's an agricultural-based type thing, and a lot of farms have to do it, um, do it, hopefully. Um, it has some... You know, it starts off with all the same things, healthy soil, build up, you know, the least invasive that uh, products and uh, techniques to the end where, you know, with traditional IPM, you know, chemical pesticides and chemical fungicides will be used as the last ditch resort. But the first most important part of integrated pest management is IDing your pest. So, um to do that, I'm going to throw this up here. I know it's not going to be, unless you can all read that, but um, this is this is a publication that goes through UMass Amherst. I'm going to give them a plug again. UMass Amherst is part of the extension service in our state of Massachusetts. Every state has an agricultural school. Every state has a cooperative extensions. Okay. This is the place to get your information. Okay. There, I, you said you have a master gardener coming here in the in a few weeks. Master gardener is part of the cooperative extensions program. Um, cooperative extension is an important. It's in every county in the country. It's the link between the agricultural research information, right, and the general public, farmers and gardeners. Master gardeners are trained to come to your property and help you if you necessary. They can help ID things. There's all sorts of great, you know, obviously programs on our apps and phones and computers now. But umassag.edu, Integrative Pest Management, IPM, do some searching. They've got great manuals, great books, um, really easy to read stuff. Um, and they'll have all information about IDing pests, okay? there's Like I said, there's amazing resources with the internet nowadays to learn your pests. Um, you can also say that again. Send our soil, to UMass or send our soil, soil, one of the soils. I don't use UMass anymore for my soil labs. I did for 30 probably years. Um, it's at the West Lab Exper Experiment Station in UMass in Amherst. Um, phenomenal uh, soil, you know, does a really great job. Um, I use Logan Labs. Okay. 
but UMass extensions, UMass, um, we have, yeah, Barnstable County Cooperative Extension. You can call them up too. They do soil testing. I can't remember how it works. I, you know, I think they have some general public ones where you bring your soil sample. I think they orchestrate stuff to get sent to UMass probably. But um, yeah, Cooperative Extensions is there for you for everything that we're talking about. Okay. Um, so my point on this website is to, um, well, this one is broken up by, it says IPM by commodity. Okay. So as a farmer, you're going to look it up zucchini and then look at the IPM program for zucchini. Um, a very smart way of dealing with pests is integrative pest management. It can be abused by commercial conventional farmers. They say, oh, we're IPM and then they skip right to the heavy pesticides. But if you follow the procedures of IPM with correct ID, uh, preventative measures and, and you know, manipulating the environment, mechanical, and then going into the least uh, and ben encouraging beneficial insects, and then using judicious use of organic sprays and then regular chemical sprays. Okay, sprays. Every pesticide has a label, okay? The label is the law. It doesn't matter if you're a farmer or a home gardener, okay? The, the, those tests have gone through, those products, these pesticides and fungicides have gone through rigorous testing to get that label, okay? So an organic company that's trying to get OMRI certified, and you see OMRI up there, they've spent millions of dollars to get that product to be sold as organic and approved on that OMRI list. So if they've done the work, they're going to put that label on that, they're going to put that, their, their logo on that label, because they've done the research, they've spent the money. It takes years to get it approved through the FD, uh, through the EPA. So um, the label is the law. The label is also something even more important. It's what's going to protect you and the environment from overuse of these things. Okay, when we start to spray BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a bacteria that's okay all around. It kills Lepidoptera. Okay, Lepidoptera is a huge family of insects, right? Guess who's part of it? The monarch butterflies there. A lot of other moths and caterpillars and butterflies that we want on this planet. So if we're just spreading BT all around and we're not doing it like effectively and we're using too much of it or not following the rules and spraying it on windy days when things spread around, okay? We're gonna potentially kill those beneficial insects, okay? Now, um, it's it really important that you understand pesticide companies, pesticides that you're going to use, pesticides that you're going to hire someone to spray on your property. The label is the law. There's there's reason on the label. We'll talk about protective gear. Okay, just because sulfur is organic doesn't mean you want to be breathing it in your lungs. Okay, or BT or spinosad, or all sorts of other things that we use, neem, everything else, you need to protect yourself. Wear gloves, possibly a respirator, okay? If you're going to spray it, you don't want to get it on your body. You can maybe have rubber boots. There's all sorts of rules on this label, okay? But one of the most important rules is the dosage, okay? What is the, how does it get mixed? What type of temperatures? What kind of agitation do you need? And more importantly, how much per gallon or how much per liter? very important. More is not better. More is actually worse for the environment, particularly when we're talking about biological natural controls, like I'm talking about, okay? Um, pesticide resistant builds up, okay? Colorado potato beetle, when um, a pesticide called Entrust came out, uh, a spinosa type pesticide, phenomenal pesticide, um, we could begin to grow potatoes again because the cotter potato beetle larvae was decimated by this um, by this uh, pesticide. Well, the cotter potato beetle is notorious for building resistance on pesticides, whether it's chemical or uh, organically derived ones. So it's not as effective as it once was. So the judicious use of it, using different modes, maybe in trust this week, but then skipping and doing another technique another week is really important to um, break up that 
insects potential for getting resistance because insects, as you know, can have many generations in a season so that genetic code and information can get passed on very quickly in insects. Okay. So the label is not just the law, number one, particularly for farmers. And if you are a farmer, you should get pesticide training and have your applicator's license. Um, and without it, you're actually breaking the law if you're a commercial grower or if you're spraying mosquito spray for somebody and you don't have that, you're breaking the law. Um, so when it comes to sprays, the label is the law. Um, look for that Omri label because that's going to be your first kind of like you might have 10 things on the shelf. And if two of them have the Omri label, that's the avenue you want to direct yourself to. OK, that's the highway to go down. OK, Um but only after you found out what you have is a pest or disease and then found out the appropriate uh, tool for the toolbox. Okay. All right. I don't know if our neighbors get me flowers from the food box store and then we're spraying neonicotoids. And the so neonicotoids is a very nasty little pesticide um, and is very commonly sprayed in the nursery industry. Um, there's nothing you can do about it unless you tell your local nursery that you want organic plants for your vegetable garden and flower gardens um, and encourage them to have more available organically. Unfortunately, that's not the common place in the nurseries around us. Um, maybe a little hit or miss here and there. You know, you might get a little, you know, a patch of you know a nursery i'm not going to say there's a nursery in churro great nursery lovely people they grow beautiful organic plants if you buy their plants you're doing great but if they're buying stuff in we don't know where the well i know where they're buying it in from but you know you don't know where they're buying it in from um so you want to encourage them to have more organic sources for you to have available that's not going to be good for the compost. Or it's going to kill. Neonicotides, I would imagine, are going to break down in compost. Are going to, the organisms are going to break it down into inert. I'm not 100% sure of that, I'm, but um, uh, you know, I haven't read the white papers on that study. But um, you know, they have been known to harm bees, honeybees in particular. Um, so the goal for us is to minimize the usage of our, of that, have diversity, break up the motive of of action how that pesticide or fungicide works um, so we min minimize um, insect resistance to it um, and then just hope that your neighbors are doing a good job you know i mean if you're friendly with them it's a good conversation to have i'm sure they might not know about it that's another problem you know a lot of people like the lack of information um, so yeah neonicotides have definitely gotten a bad rap over the years um, so the key thing here is to see, is it bat biological or naturally derived? Naturally derived is something that could be like sulfur or a copper, um, you know, a, a mineral based type thing. Uh, oils, those are kind of like naturally derived. Biological means that it's something living. Okay. So it needs to be fresh. You're not going to use BT from last year. You know, it's a biological, it's an organism it needs to be uh, handled fresh. So knowing which ones you're using is important as well. Um, there's a, uh, a cool product that we use another it's for disease control. It's called, and pest control too. It's called kaolin clay, with a K, K, kaolin clay. We will dip our cucumbers and, zucchini and squash plants in this powder, this light clay powder, and then send it off into the field at planting time. Um, very common uh, source. Um, for disease prevention. And I believe it does affect a few insects will get deterred by it too. Um, so biological is kind of the living and then the naturally derived is stuff that's comes from the earth, but is um, not alive. Um, so kale and clay, for instance, I can have a bag of it laying around for a while. As long as it stays dry, I'm, I'm okay to continue using it. Um, so that's why I put biological and naturally derived. So you know what you're getting. If it is biological, you've got to make sure it's fresh. Um, okay, so ATRA, uh, I'm trying to think of what it stands for, I can't think of it anymore, but um, ATRA has a lot of um, publications. It's kind of like a uh, research-based um, organization, a nonprofit organization that helps organic farmers 
really get going, answers a lot of people's questions. They've got classes and they do all sorts of stuff. Um, but they also, they just have a lot of publications. So when it comes to biorationals, which is what kind of the normal, we you know, biological stuff, we call it biorationals. Um, that also includes uh, uh, beneficial insects, if you're going to buy beneficial insects. Uh, there's a wealth of not, of information at the Atra website. So the, I'll just give you the, the basic one here is atra.ncat, I guess that's North Carolina, at.org. Um, from there, you can branch off into the web and you'll find all sorts of um, information about all the types of pests and sprays we can use. UMass Amherst has amazing vegetable production uh, manuals, how to grow vegetables, how to, to take care of pests. Um, I can't recommend just university studies um, for the most part in the organic world are good. University studies in the chemical world is manipulated by lobbyists and petrochemical industries and the pharmaceutical companies. So, you know, those results, I wouldn't, you know, but generally speaking, the OMRI stuff, those white papers are available um, and good to go. Um, all right. So, and those of you locally can come meet me at the farmer's market, bring me your bug, take pictures, um, show me your disease. Don't bring me your diseases, but you can take a picture of your disease, bring it to me. I can help ID it. Um, but integrated pest management, pest ID and disease is first on this list for a reason. Okay. Let's make sure we know what we have. All right. All right. Common pests and diseases. This is kind of your generic uh, list. Um, and like I said earlier, if anyone has any, we are winding down to my talk, but if anyone has any uh, questions about specifics, just give me a holler. Caterpillars, that's the one everyone's got. And if you grow any kind of brassica, you've definitely had caterpillars. Tomato hornworms, there's a big fat one right on your tomato plants. Um, there's all sorts of bud worms for cannabis growers, all sorts of insects in the Lepidoptera family. Uh, moths and caterpillar, moth and butterflies. So caterpillars are pretty notorious for chomping and chewing on leaves. They live a pretty distinctive um, calling card that they've been there with their chewing, rasping type um, uh, way that they destroy a plant. Um, for those of you who've had tomato hornworm, you can have a beautiful tomato crop and then go back the next morning and half of it be chopped down because they're big and they can move quickly. Um, so that's definitely a very good one to pro to use floating row covers with stop the flight. If they don't know there's a tomato under there, they're not going to lay the tomato, their eggs and lay and, uh, the caterpillars aren't going to hatch, um, squash vine borer, striped cucumber beetle, or no other caterpillar, um, squash vine borer, um, Colorado, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting the beetles, but, um, cabbage loopers. Okay, that's that little green worm you find on your broccoli and your kale and a whole mess of other things. There's different types of cabbage worms. Um, all could be prevented by floating row covers. Okay, um, so really a very relatively easy pest to stop using mechanical means. Okay, a lot of great pesticides out there. BT, spinosad, neem, a whole bunch of things that can be used to um to to kill and deter caterpillars okay beetles and bugs okay these are a little bit harder to get because if you think about it the shell of those insects are a little bit tougher okay the squash bug it's got like an armor on it you know so it's that even sprays don't really do that like it's not going to be a contact type spray thing um beetles and bugs a great uh a good use for um uh, horticultural light grade oil sprays. Um, dormant oil does get overwintered insects and bugs, um, bugs and beetles. Um, dormant oil is thicker. We put it on before things go into growth. So it kind of sits dormant. Um, we want to use horticultural grade oils or they'll sometimes call it all season. You'll see that at the, at the nursery. There's a company that makes all season uh, oil spray. 
or horticultural grade oil, um, vegetable base for organic farmers instead of petroleum based. Um, dormant oil initially was like diesel back in the day. Like they would just spray your fruit trees with diesel um, and kerosene and things like that. Um, smothering the beetles. Okay. But beetles and bugs can be prevented with Remay once again. Okay. So um, if that's your first thing to do is if you, if you know you have these, let's break the cycle up. Um, caro potato beetle is very good at stopping uh, production with floating row covers. Um, striped cucumber beetle is another very intense bug that also spreads disease too. It's a vector of disease it's called. Um, so floating row covers, they're a little bit harder with the botanicals um, need, you know, we used to have, um, you know, well, you still can get rotenone is a powder from a chrysanthemum. Uh, yeah, chrysanthemum uh, seed, I believe it is ground up might be the root, but it's something that we used on organic farms forever, still used today, rotenone. It kills a lot of insects, beneficial ones too. We really want to be careful with them. Um, I don't think they make Sabadilia dust anymore, but that's one we used to use a lot of. Um, pyrethrum. No, that's the daisy. I'm sorry. Pyrethrum from a daisy. Rotenone is from chrysanthemum, I think. Um, I apologize. I, it's been years since I used those things, but um, rotenone, those are botanicals that come from plants. Um, they're effective against beetles and bugs. They're expensive. When it gets wet, you got to reapply. It's like a very it's a battle. Okay. It's a, it's bugs and beetles. We want to prevent them as much as possible because it really is a battle with those guys. Caterpillars are a little easier to deal with. Um, but the easiest to deal with is the soft body insects. Kind of by the name the name says soft body. We are looking at like insects like aphids, you know, are the main ones we have. We can smother them with soap, potato, fatty acid soaps. Um, these are, you know, non-biological ways of dealing it, but um, can really effectively do that. Um, the soft body insects are also really easy to take care of with beneficial insects. So things like the grease la uh, green lacewing, um, your aphid alligator, uh, aphid is our main soft body insect, um, thrips um, can be a problem. Um, cotton cushion scale, some of those types of things um, are a little bit easier to deal with. Um, but beneficial insects are a real go-to there. Um, remay and floating roll covers work okay, but um, they're small, so they can get into little cracks here and there. All right, excuse me. Um, diseases, blights, rots, mildews, molds, and galls. These are all different types of fungal diseases, bacteria diseases, some viral diseases can be in there. Um, so really important proper ID, okay? Every blight is not the same, okay? Early blight is different than late blight. Septoria is different than all of them. Um, uh, black sooty mold is different than powdery mildew, okay? Botrytis scenario is one that if you've grown strawberries, you've probably seen the gray mold on the strawberry. That's botrytis. If you've grown cannabis, you've definitely seen botrytis called bud rot. Um, mildews, powdery mildews, very common in our squash family, very common in flocks, different types of uh, flowers. Um, you've seen, you see, you'll see powdery mildew a lot on zinnias. If you've ever seen the powdery coat on a zinnia. Um, once again, ID is key when it comes to all of this, but with diseases, it's really important because everything disease is very specific of what uh, to, how to handle it. Um, with diseases, airflow is of utmost important. Water irrigation control and management is very important. Um, airflow, 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 healthy soil, really important for disease and blights. Um, if it's a soil-borne organism, maybe pruning the bottom of the tomato plant so that the soil splash doesn't splash up when it rains as much, doing things like that to prevent um, them in the first place and not give them a, a great environment to grow. Seed selection, you know, find that phlox flower that's powdery mildew resistant. Um, certain zinnias are better and worse than others. Okay, um, once again, UMass Amherst Integrative Pest Management by Vegetables. Once again, 
Johnny selected seeds. Um, we talked about them yesterday, last week in my seed talk. They've got charts and graphs on their website, all sorts of great things, all the information. They're going to sell you all the pesticides that of the problems you have. Um, but remember, they also sell floating row cover. So um, we and and uh, or you know ways of fostering your um, soil. So. Don't overlook that and go right for the pesticides. Um, they'll have Johnny's website is is pretty phenomenal now. Um, it's really got a lot going on. And once again, Atra. Um, sorry, I don't remember what it stands for at the moment, but it is a phenomenal organization. Um, and that's it. Do you guys have any questions here? Okay. So many questions. Yeah. What do you got? Um, by the way, ATRA stands for Appropriate Technology Transferred for Rural Areas. That's, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, can, says, I can remember why. I now, now I remember why. I, remember. I used to back in the day. Um, Claudia says, what about bugs on grape leaves? Uh, well, grapes are a really great one for floating row covers. If you can figure out the strategy um, on how to get it covered. Um, but I would need to know what specific did she say caterpillars is that what she said or bugs, bugs. no i actually yeah, so, it's, you know, I didn't bugs say... is a big term um but when i was talking about bugs um i'm talking about things like squash bugs um geez i'm just caught a potato as a beetle so bugs and beetles are different but a lot of the same uh organic methods are used to control them um so ID is key, critical. Um, you know, do I, do I, I'm just looking forward to can you hear me? around here. I don't, I don't have my email, but everyone, you can put my email in the, um, in your chat, davesgreens at gmail.com. Dave's Greens being the name of my farm. Um, and you can send me pictures of what you have. Um, and I could be happy to uh, steer you in the right direction. But when it comes to bugs and beetles, um, we really, uh, horticultural sprays, oils are going to be one of the main things. Neem extract, um, things like rotenone and um, erythrum are other sprays that we would use for bugs and beetles, um, generally speaking. But let's ID it first and then we'll go from there. My favorite was for wireworm. I had the actor send me saying it's wireworm for eating. Mm -hmm. Cats. Yep. So you have a wireworm problem? Not anymore. <laughs> so you use the you use the that's a good thing. What you just are you saying you use use the carrots as a trap to attract them? I'm sorry I didn't bring that up. That's a very should have been in my crop rotation scheme, but that's called a trap crop. You technically grew a trap crop to protect your liatris, you said? No, I just took a carrot. Yep. Out of oh, the actual, yeah. Market, yep. Stuck it right in yeah, there. that's the same thing. Or growing it does the same thing. So my quick story, I think I might have talked about it early the other last week or whenever, but um, when I was a huge pumpkin grower, growing 30, 40 acres of pumpkins at a time, we would ring the whole pumpkin field, if it was four or five acres, whatever it was, with uh, blue hubbard squash the blue hubbard squash is like the squash bugs favorite squash to eat so we would keep and minimize the uh, bugs on our pumpkins and it would go to the um the squash um blue hubbard squash is not the biggest seller in the world so a lot of it ends up getting composted but if it has a little like um if those of you who've had squash um bugs before they can do some gnawing and charring, and then you kind of get like a little callus growth that grows over it. Not a real problem if you're selling the Blue Hubbard squash where you're eating the meat. But if you're selling the perfect orange round pumpkin and you start to have chewing and grasping and like parenchyma cells growing and like, you know, scabs basically, um, it's very important for its um, storage ability. It, you know, gets reduced and stuff like that. So trap crops, I apologize. That should have been on there with my... Uh, crop rotation thing um, and it's another mechanical method although be it biological way of moving things around 
what you're doing basically is drawing it with, you know, in, encouraging them their food, which they love, it's carrots and parsnips and things like that. But but the real thing that you want to do to get rid of wireworms is to have that diverse, healthy soil. The nematodes, and you can actually buy beneficial nematodes from uh, insectary mm -hmm. and apply them to your soil, and they will go ahead and devour those wireworms. So that is a, a bio-rational, in, an, in, an insect, I mean, an organism that then competes with the insect. Um, so nematodes, beneficial nematodes is a cool uh, technique. Um, wireworms can be very damaging. What do you got? Um, what other flowers do you suggest that work for insect control? Um, so when we talk about that, we're, we're talking about creating an insectary for insects for uh, uh, growing flowers for to encourage them. Uh, plants of the of an umble type flower, um, carrot is an umble type thing, a Queen's Anne lace, um, scabiosa, um, dill, all sorts of things. And that um, will really, th that type of flower is very encouraging for beneficial insects. But so is things like tansy flowers, um, chamomile, um, sweet alyssum, uh, thyme flowers from the thyme plant. Um, what else? It's a good one. Um, this machia flowers. There's there's a, so many choices nowadays. Um, basically, small little flowers that are rich in nectar are kind of the angle to go. Obviously, a quick internet search, you're going to find a whole bunch. And if you go to a place like Johnny's Selected Seeds, they have a beneficial insect mix. Okay, but it's going to have 10 or 15 different plants in it. It's actually something I sell at my nursery, which is all organic, by the way. No neonicotides, little plug um, for churro grown uh, <laughs> organic plants. Um, I also sell beneficial insect starts in little four. I grow things in four packs, not six packs. But um, to give a little start, you know, some people have a hard time with the seed mix. They don't germinate quite as well. Maybe slugs or snails eat them. So sometimes starting them by little, you know, as in plugs, you can start little transplants and do it that way. Um, so, yeah, I would mainly stick with like dills and things like that right now. Sweet alyssum, um, thyme. Yeah. Is it too late to plant crop, cover crop? What is the ideal time frame to plant and harvest cover crop? It is too late to plant cover crop in the Northeast. I don't know where everyone's calling in from or on Zoom, I mean. Um, but yes, uh, there is a definite time and a place for appropriate cover crops. Um, and the important thing to remember is what are you trying to do with that cover crop? Are you building soil? Are you building soil over the winter and holding or holding nutrients over the winter and then tilling it under before your next plant comes in, which would be typically a heavy feeder like we talked about last week. Um, so if you're doing a soil building cover cropping, you build the soil with leguminous plants like vetch and clover that produces nitrogen in your, in your, into the plants, gets into the soil. Then the plants that are heavy feeders follow that. Um, if you have deep tillage needs, you need to get down deep. Daikon radish is one. Oats, clovers, vetches. The, the list is phenomenal when it comes to cover crops. It's really a matter of the season and what you're planning on doing. There's great early spring cover crop mixes. Once again, you can get a mix from a place like Johnny's. Um, there's a late fall season mix. There's a winter mix. Um, so timing it. If you're going to do understory cover cropping where you have a tomato plant growing up and you have something growing underneath it, that's called uh, companion planting and interplanting. Um, that's a different season. Um, hairy vetch is an incredible accumulator of nitrogen. It fixes atmospheric nitrogen. and um, But the problem in New England, so the traditional New England farming cover crop for the winter is hairy vetch and winter rye in a combination. Okay. Um, the issue with the hairy vetch is that it takes longer to germinate and get growing and get a good root system so that it can survive through the winter 
and then really crank in the spring, early spring. So <laughs> under sowing crops with hairy vetch, I typically like to get my hairy vetch, start to get it on the soil, particularly if there's an opening and a, there's a blank spot all of a sudden, get it in there mid-August, third week of August, typically. But the mix with, so I get the, the hairy vetch on where I can, or if I have a fallow area, I definitely get it on thick. And then I can come back with the um, rye grass and plant it more towards October, okay? Because it can germinate in cold soils. We've even gotten good stands in November. Um, those are really important, that winter cover, because we never want to leave our soil over the winter. It's destroying the soil food web. So um, cover crops is a pretty specific topic. And... Um, once again, now you have my email in the chat. Um, if you want to, if you're specifically targeting uh, a weed or a pest or something and trying to break that up, you can ask me that question uh, on chat as well. And the email is davesgreens at gmail.com. Yeah. Davesgreens gmail.com. What else you got? Anyone else? All right. And how about you folks in here? Everyone good? Um, you know, I can't can't really think of it, anything in particular. I mean, birds want big seeds, I guess, right? So a vetch is a big seed. Clovers are small seeds. Things like oats, great mulch to use, great cover crop to use. I'm thinking about sunflowers, of course. Um, they're, gone over the winter. they're gone over the winter, yeah. I mean, it- We got the very around us, not in our room. Mm -hmm. We love it. Yeah. We just, we do everything, just going green and brown. Good. Um, you're on your way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't think of cover crops and birds. I know they'll benefit because the insects are going to benefit from them. So the birds are going to eat the insects. So there's going to be beneficial there. Um, but just specifically, I can't think of, I mean, the vetches make a nice seed pod that a bird would probably like to eat that seed, I would guess. So, but that's not typically until the spring and like late spring, early summer by the, you know, that when you plant it in the fall, it doesn't flower right away, it grows, and then it's the spring when it begins to flower. So, any other questions? Good to go. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, we'll we, look at that. We got it done by by, by seven today. Um, there's my typical thank you. Oh, it says churro, but I did mean province time. <laughs> um, I, I really have to thank the library. You guys are awesome for hosting me and my classes. Um, and I want to, and helping with Zoom because that's a technology I can use, but I can never set up. Um, I need to thank my teachers. I need to thank all of you for coming and all of you on Zoom. Thank you for Zooming in. And I dedicate all my uh, efforts to sell all sentient beings. May they use the information and create a better community planet. And that is the end of my talk. Thanks for coming, everyone. And thanks for coming, everyone, on Zoom. And send me questions if you have any. You can go fast next week, I do. Yeah. You'll need it. I do.